Hi, I'm Jim Farron. Today we are with Seth Moore and Jake Andreg, both Republican candidates for Utah House District 6, which comprises Lehigh and Saratoga Springs. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to have us. Pleasure to be here. Well, very happy to have you here. Seth, tell me, let's take just a minute and tell us what you believe qualifies you for this experience, for being a state legislature. All right. Legislator. Uh, I actually had some experience working in Washington, D.C. with the uh, Republican staff on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and being there with the legislative staff, I really got to see the inside workings of how legislation is passed, how effective legislation works, and how ineffective legislation ends up that way, uh, and really taught me the details of the legislative process. I also have the experience of working in a large business. I work for Overstock.com. And I have experience working with budgets on the orders of tens of millions of dollars. And my primary responsibility with those budgets is to find the waste, find the dollars that aren't adding value, and find ways to streamline it out to make sure we get value out of every dollar spent. I think that's the skill that Utahns are really looking for in their legislature. And I think between that uh, experience working at scale with budgets and my previous work with the legislative experience, I think I'm prepared to hit the ground running and get that done for Lehigh and Saratoga. Excellent. Jake Andereg. Same what, question? Same question. What qualifies <laughs> you? What, what in your background gives you the experience to be a state legislator? Well, first and foremost, I'm a small business owner. I have been for 10 years and uh, have a lot of experience working and, you know, right in our own community here in Lehigh and Saratoga Springs. Uh, I've, uh, I've had employees, and not to the same level, but I know what it takes to actually create jobs, and I know what it takes to actually make payroll. Um, in addition to that, last year I worked as Senator Mike Lee's Northern Utah Director, and in that regard I worked on really kind of that whole intersection between state and federal. I worked with all the county commissioners, the mayors, the legislators, uh, was working behind the scenes in many respects on legislation, not just reading it, but actually helping to put it together uh, working with different uh, co-sponsors and the governor and, and whatnot, uh, doing a lot of the stuff behind the scenes. So I really understand kind of how that works on the back end. Um, you know, I do think that budgets are very, very important, and, uh, and I think that we need to be looking at them. But it also is, I think, a deeper component to that. It's understanding how those numbers actually affect real people and, uh, and what we're doing in the legislature that is, that is going to create a bottom line for them. Excellent. So tell me, if you... Uh you succeed in seeking this office and become a state legislator, what are going to be your top priorities? What is it that's driving you? Um, my children's future, my children's education, my children's opportunities in the economy. I mean, right now we are still in a very, very difficult economic situation. Utah's fared better than some, but not as good as Southers. And uh, the reality is, is education, improvements, even if it's incremental, annual improvements to education. That is both creating good atmosphere and good uh, learning atmospheres for the kids, but also including in parent involvement and also getting teachers involved because you're not going to come into a long-term solution without having the teachers at the table. Uh, education drives jobs. My second thing is jobs in the economy. Jobs in the economy is a, is a huge thing, creating the, that environment where jobs can develop and grow. Uh, the third thing would be cutting back on the size of government, getting out of the way of the private sector, and then I think very, the fourth thing, uh, very, very specific to Lehigh and Saratoga Springs is growth. You know, transportation, capital improvements to transportation, uh, water rights, I mean, land rights, a whole, a whole host of things. They kind of all bundle together. Very good. Seth, how about you? If you get this, uh, if, you, if you win this seat, what are, what's your top priority going to be? What is it that you're running for? So the two things that concern me the most are, one, the difficulty that people have had in weathering this recession. And I really see that on two fronts. One is the loss of jobs. And I think we see a pretty clear path forward to getting those jobs back. But I think if we don't keep pushing, uh, the natural state of things is that the state will retrench and move backwards economically. Uh, so I think we need to make sure we're streamlining bad regulation that holds back job creation, uh, simplify business licensing, uh, do the things necessary so that people want to create jobs here in Utah, and so that companies want to relocate here. Uh, the second component of it is we need to make sure that our education system is strong enough to support all the jobs that people want to bring to Utah. You know, we have a great business climate. Uh, we need to make sure that the uh, universities and schools within Utah are good enough that we can keep those jobs among our local Utahns rather than forcing companies to hire outside. 
because we'd rather see our children have these great jobs that are coming here. What specific legislation do you have in mind that you would sponsor or that you would support? Uh, so, uh, you know, I mentioned business licensing, and it seems like a relatively simple matter, but ultimately you have to fill out business licenses with every jurisdiction in which you reside. And so I met somebody who had to fill out five separate business licenses for a single location, and when he replicated across two, it just multiplied to ten. Uh, and each of those came with their own fee at a total of thousands of dollars uh, and loads of man hours that were taken away from him being able to actually do business. I think one simple piece of legislation we could sponsor right off the bat is to create a state licensing database for business licensing where all of the other jurisdictions requirements get pulled in. It's all handled electronically. There's no filing fees, no overhead for handling data entry. And that way there's a single point of access. Uh, there's another number of other components I'd like to see. I'd like to see UVU expanded to include uh, greater uh, programs for technical education to make sure that the tech growth we're experiencing uh, can find a resource for technical jobs. And I would yeah. also mm -hmm. like to make sure that our uh, elementary and middle and high schools are preparing people in math and sciences and critical reasoning so that they're prepared to take those positions if it's an area they enjoy. Uh, when they arrive at the university level. Very good, thank you. Jake, do you have in mind specific legislation that you would want to sponsor or issues that you're, would be your primary focus? Sure, I mean, I've got actually quite a few that I have had in mind. I would say on a very broad sense, um, one of the very first and foremost things that we need to do is we need to go through and really pull back on our dependency on the federal dollar. I know that it's been said before, <laughs> and I know that a lot of other legislators are, are, have tried to tackle this. Um, the reality is, is of the 12.4 billion that's in the state budget, five billion, just over five billion of that comes from federal dollars. Um, there's no way that we're just gonna cut that off overnight. It's not gonna happen. But if we were incrementally to go through each of those programs that relies on those and start <coughs> pulling back two, 3% every year and consistently do that, legislative cycle, legislative cycle over a decade, we can pull ourselves back to less than 10% of dependent on, on the federal dollar. And that would be one of the first and foremost things that I would attack, but it, it definitely would be a long-term plan. Um, I would say secondly, uh, coming back to education a little bit, is uh, you know they are, we are spending so much money on uh, architecture and, and different things, uh, what I consider to be unnecessary, a little bit of waste in education. I would like to see smaller class sizes, more buildings with, uh, that cater to a smaller demographic area so that you can get that student to teacher ratio lower, maybe even get more parents in the classroom. I mean, I, I definitely want to see the improvements. And third, with that education, getting technology in the classrooms. I mean, these kids are gonna come out of uh, elementary school knowing how to program in the next 20 years and our public education's 30 years behind and as, as far as technology goes. We'll talk a little more about public education in a moment, but first, uh, an issue that's kind of been on the forefront recently in the last couple of years has been the issue of immigration, mm -hmm. illegal immigration. Any thoughts on that, what, what uh, you believe the state of Utah ought to be doing? Well, right now the state of Utah is and has taken steps, House Bill 116, to quote unquote codify a worker, guest worker program, basically to help people come out of the, the woodworks there's some fundamental flaws with what was passed. Uh, fundamentally, number one, it's not constitutional. Anything that that would do would require a waiver from the federal government, which we're not likely to get unless uh, Mitt Romney's in office, and then even then, it's questionable. Uh, secondly, it, uh, the time for people to come out and actually register has, I believe, expired. And in that regard, who's, who's gonna benefit it from it at this point while it's still in this flux, in this limbo? Uh, House Bill 116, I think, uh, you have to look at it from two, two standpoints. The federal government has the naturalization rights as far as uh, you know, how people become naturalized citizens. States, with that, don't have any recourse right now for enforcement. They don't. But I believe that the Tenth Amendment clearly gives the state to, the rights to enforce laws within their own jurisdiction, their own land. I would be in favor of enforcement of those federal naturalization laws, basically, if you're here illegally, we have the right to check your documentation, we have the right to pull you in. The reason I believe that is because the federal government's not, for most part, not taking the steps necessary to really make that happen. And so because of that, the states can't just sit back idly and say, well, we're gonna rely on Big Brother to help us out. 
It's not happening. So from that standpoint, it's an issue. The problem is, is anything we would do on that side of it would need to be coupled with our congressional delegation. It would need to, to include, if they can, get border controls uh, increased. It would need to include a total rewriting of the naturalization process and the immigration process. Uh, I don't think the Founding Fathers intended for just get here to the states, have a baby, and you're going to be a citizen. I don't think that was ever the intent, and I think we've got to get back to um, really what the intent was with that uh, amendment. Very good. Seth, do you have views on the issues of immigration, illegal immigration, or some of these other issues we talked about, budget priorities, health care, public land use policy? Yeah. Uh -huh. So on immigration specifically, my wife is an immigrant. She came from Canada. I went through the whole process, spent the hundreds of hours required to fill out the documentation. I know how difficult that is, and I appreciate the plight of immigrants. That said, it's also really frustrating having been through that process to see people jump the process and come illegally and reap the same benefits. Uh, and so I understand the need for immigration enforcement. I also understand the desire of immigrants to come here. Uh, and so my goal would be to work with the federal government to find ways to improve the process and simplify the process for legal immigration especially for people looking to come and contribute to our country. Uh, in terms of uh, enforcement, I also believe the state does have a role in enforcing immigration. There are very few laws for which the federal government can enforce uh, criminal law on the ground in our cities because they simply don't have the manpower to do it. Conventionally, that's always been left to state and local governments. And so I believe there's definitely a role for state and local government in enforcement of our federal immigration laws. Uh, in terms of our uh, lands policy, absolutely. One of my biggest concerns is that I think we need to make better use of our public lands to make sure that we're pouring revenue into our endowment for education. You know, we frequently have this debate of we hate high class sizes, but we also hate high taxes, and we're constantly given this false dichotomy that we have to choose. If we're responsible with the way we develop public lands and we garner all the revenues that we need, those revenues funnel into our endowment for education and only the interest comes out to pay for education. Using that interest is how we lower class sizes without raising taxes. Uh, other states have been successful in doing it. New Mexico is a prime example. 25% of their education budget comes off of interest from their endowment created completely by revenue from public lands. And so I think there's a lot we can do in that field. And I think as we get federal lands back, or lands back from the federal government, as well as revenues from the federal government, we can achieve that goal. So Seth, speaking of public education, kind of the the 800-pound gorilla in the room, something the legislature deals with an awful lot. What specific reforms would you advocate in public education or higher education? What would you support? What would you advocate, even sponsor, if any at all? Uh, so I think we need to work really hard to improve uh, our student-to-teacher ratio in our schools. Uh, you know, that's always a real challenge when you have a large class because the student body doesn't all learn at the same rate and they don't all learn in the same way. And so the larger the class, the harder it is to give any sort of customized education or any sort of special aid to each student. And so I think we need to work on uh, improving that ratio. I also think we can leverage technology to help us do that affordably uh, through online classes in which a significant portion of the class is taught online through videos very scalably to a large number of students, but there is also personal attention available. Uh, there's been great things done with uh, the Open School of Utah, I believe it is, in online education, where they've been able to achieve some great results for some kids, let kids learn at a faster pace if they're able. Uh, I also think we need to sponsor a major initiative to uh, help our universities expand our technical offerings within Utah. If you look at the job growth in Utah and where it's principally coming, it's principally in our technology sector. And I think we need to make sure that our education uh, and our higher ed, ed system is focused on providing uh, our students with the opportunity to enter those jobs if they so choose. Uh, one of the great points in which we can do that is by bringing more technical ed down to UVU so that kids don't have to decide between uh, moving to Salt Lake or leaving the state and choosing the program they want. Good. So Jake, specific reforms in public education or higher education that you would support? You know, I actually think that, uh, I, I appreciate the support, that's actually what's on my website is, is what he just said, but um, really I think UVU actually has fairly good technical programs right now. They could be improved upon, but I think UVU has actually been on the cutting edge of, of a lot of the technical and, 
and statistics and math and, and sciences, uh, in, uh, I don't want to say industries, but part of the education the curriculum. Um, I definitely think that the student to teacher ratio uh, is, a, is an important thing. I also think technology in the classrooms are an important thing. But I would say probably first and foremost is it actually starts before you get to the university. Uh, I was working with the mayor up in uh, Perry, Weber County, and uh, he, he teaches at a technical uh, uh, school for high school. And what they do is they actually identify kids with very significant math and engineering skills who really get, you know, drives uh, in those specific areas. And they bring them into this technical training school where they do, they do hands-on mathematics, hands-on uh, mechanical engineering and whatnot, and they go through and they create models and they put stuff together. Well, over the last five years, they have gleaned such a high reputation that they've got worldwide companies now coming to their graduation and recruiting these kids as 17-year-olds, giving them fairly large contracts, saying, come work for us, get right into your field, and we'll send you to college. I think that we need to be funding a lot more of those, uh, of those tech programs right in the high school level, right in the, the junior high level, and get them the training that they need where they can move right into the applied, uh, the applied industries. So, so, Jake, let me ask you the, uh, one of the great bottom line questions, and mm -hmm. that is, under what conditions would you support a tax increase There's, or a tax decrease? Or a tax decrease? Yeah. One of the big things for me is, so we started the last legislative cycle knowing that we had roughly $295 million surplus. There was never a discussion on a refund. Didn't even come up. And rightly so. I mean, yeah, education hadn't had increases to pay or anything like that for, for five years. And so there was, there was definitely some need for the money to be funneled back in. However, when you're gauging, I think as a legislator, as you're gauging the need of resources to the state to provide services versus the burden that it applies upon your citizenry, you really have to look at what the citizens want. And the problem is, is it's more than what they want. My first question is going to be, do we really need and want this program, whatever it might be? The second question is, okay, are you willing to pay for it? And that requires me to be very well engaged and connected with my constituents. And if I'm getting the vast majority of those constituents back saying, you know what, we are willing to pay for that, then I think that we look at it. Otherwise, I tend to lean towards you cut taxes whenever you can, as much as you can, as often as you can. Just a general philosophy. So, Seth, tell me, under what conditions would you support a tax increase? Uh, I don't believe that we need a net tax increase in Utah, nor that we will. If you look at the amount of tax revenue we get as a percentage of our GDP, uh, realistically, there is enough flowing into our government, state, federal, and local, to cover all of the public services that we really need. Uh, I think the circumstance where foreseeably the state might increase taxes is if it's offset by a decrease in federal taxes and federal rebates back. Uh, I would love for the principal responsibility for revenue collection and spending to lie with the state rather than with the federal government. But currently, the federal government makes up a huge portion of our budget. Uh, the other circumstance is when it comes to tax cuts, I think there's a fundamental ph philosophical point here, which is the money belongs to the people who earned it. It doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong to the public. There are certain needs that we have as a public that we agree that we're better off doing together, things like roads. But with the exception of the satisfaction of those basic public needs, any time there's excess revenue, it should be returned to the people. One final question. There, there, there seems in, in serving in the legislature, there's a balance between being a statesman who leads his or her constituents in political thought and ideas versus the representative who reflects and represents the views of those of those constituents that you represent. How do you strike a balance? Or more specifically, if there's, a, if there's a particular issue that you feel strongly about, but you were to discover that the majority of your constituents felt differently, how do you vote? Seth? So this is a great question. Uh, one of the things I learned while I was working in Washington and was able to observe a lot of United States senators is that the really good ones when they differ with their constituents, they go back and they make the argument to their constituents as to why they differ. Uh, your job really is to represent the constituents, and there are instances in which you may have more information than the constituents. But if that's the case and they feel passionately that they disagree with you, you need to make the argument to them. And if you can't persuade them, they probably shouldn't be persuaded. Ultimately, we believe in the wisdom of a democracy. Uh, 
Uh, we believe that people, when granted proper information, make right decisions. That's one of the great things about our American democracy. And so I think your responsibility as a statesman is to take the argument to your constituents, try and convince your constituents that you're correct. If you can't, you should probably vote your constituents' interest because ultimately that's what you're sent to do. Very good. And Jake, how do you do that? Well, in our, in our democratic republic, we represent people in groups. And the reality is, is groups differ from area to area. I would look at being a leader slightly different than, I think, how you posed the question. Uh, I call it the human element behind it. I don't know if you've ever taken the Utah State Republican platform and the Democratic State Democratic platform and looked at them side by side. When you look at them side by side, except for about 10 lines that are totally opposed, <laughs> everything else is pretty much the same. So what you need to do, statesmanship really is leading out and saying to someone who disagrees with you, you see this differently, good. Help me understand how and why you see it different. If you see it differently than me, then I start listening and saying, well, actually, I believe that, I believe that, and I believe that. And where the difference comes in is implementation. We both have a lot of the same core values, especially here in Utah. What is the difference is how we would implement those values. So sometimes it is representing your constituents exactly how they would want to vote, but sometimes it's educating them and then being able to reach statesmanship is reaching across party lines and really being able to pull them in and saying, this is why you should go this way because it fulfills our, that's where negotiation really takes place is the fulfillment of your common beliefs. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We've been today with Seth Moore and Jake Andreg, both Republican can, uh, candidates for House District 6 in the Utah State Legislature. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gabrielle Hodson, and I'm running for the House of, uh, State House of Representatives in District 6. Um, that primarily serves Lehigh. I am a professor of anthropology, medical anthropology, and social health and diversity, researching and studying how humans live, how we socially organize, and <clears throat> how we maintain our health. In the current atmosphere of economic challenges, I chose to run for political office to make a difference first in our education system, our health care, and our air quality to improve the lives of all Utah families. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that education is one of the most important functions of state government. The judges felt that it was impossible for any American child to succeed and meaningfully contribute to their country for any, um, without a good ed um, education. Research has shown that the brains of youngest children between the ages of two and four are the most flexible and capable of learning. Utah ranks last in the nation for, for per-student spending in education. The future of our state lies in our ability to successfully educate our children from a very early age, providing them with the tools they will need to govern this state and lead the rest of the world in the 21st century. As Einstein noted, we cannot find solutions to the problems of today with the same thinking that created the problems in the past. After teaching for more than 14 years in Utah, I have come to know that profound social change can be realized through the empowerment and liberation of our students. I believe that education advances democracy, equality, and creative thinking. And I always urge my students to use critical thinking habits and to um, actively participate in their own educational process while maintaining a respect for them as unique individuals with an abiding faith in their intellectual capabilities. One of four high school students don't finish high school, in comparison with only 6% for the rest of the nation, with less than half of our special students completing school. Only 7% of our college-age students complete their higher education studies in Utah. Utah students have inadequate access to computer technology, and our schools continue 
to rely on the outdated methods of memorization and regurgitation on tests, a method that is no longer useful in today's global business market. Our education system needs immediate and dramatic changes to avoid a catastrophic future with an untrained and unprepared workforce for the jobs that need doing and the answers that will redirect our steps and take us back into a leadership position in the world. I know that our youth have the intelligence and excellence of character within them to accomplish this task, but we must begin with the youngest children and teach all Utah children those principles of character and the knowledge and skills that they will fort that will fortify them for an increasingly competitive future. In an age of economic challenges, we need to create and build businesses that expand economic opportunities without damaging our air quality. We need to lead the nation in creating local cooperative enterprises to ensure the optimum health of our citizens, similar to what is now practiced in Colorado Springs. We need to focus on expanding our reliance on the God-given renewable resources of solar, geothermal, and wind power, rather than depleting the earth of non-renewable resources at the peril of human health. We need to continue being better stewards of our land, treasuring it rather than exploiting and destroying it. We need to force lo lo stronger, forge lo stronger local communities that are cooperatively working together in the legacy of our ancestral pioneers to create a cleaner and more beautiful Utah. We must educate our children to accomplish these goals, and I will fight to see these changes are accomplished. I ask for your support and your vote in November. Thank you.